Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Tonight we are beginning a brand new study of the book of Leviticus. And so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Leviticus chapter 1. We'll be there in just a few moments. We will not be having all of the scriptures on the screen as we have over the past couple of years. We're going to have a little bit of a chart tonight, so it'll be important to have a Bible with you and be able to turn to Leviticus chapter 1. But again, we'll be there in just a few moments. If you have any questions, if you have any comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. Send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can also call or send me a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we are starting a brand new study of Leviticus, and yet, of course, in a sense, we are simply continuing in our studies of Genesis and Exodus, and we are summarizing this study as a study of God's people in the wilderness. That's kind of the, the tagline for uh, this series of lessons. In Genesis, of course, we had the creation, then we had the flood, and Noah, and the ark, and all that, followed by a transition to a study of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And one of Jacob's sons, of course, was Joseph, who was sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt, where he was then promoted all the way up to the top when he ended up saving the nation of Egypt and his own family from a seven-year, very severe famine. So although God had given the promised land to Abraham and his descendants, uh, they left that land to go find food in Egypt, and all of this we find in the book of Genesis. Well, in Egypt, they are eventually enslaved, so hundreds of years go by. And uh, there is a new pharaoh that comes on the scene who really didn't appreciate everything that Joseph had done hundreds of years earlier. And so the current pharaoh is very upset. He's very scared. He's nervous. They're going to take over. And so he puts them in extreme slavery. He is a cruel man. And eventually they cry out to God for help. God hears their cry. And God uses Moses to lead them out of the land of Egypt. So that is basically the book of Exodus in a nutshell. And when they first leave Egypt, they cross over the Red Sea, they end up at the base of Mount Sinai where God gives them the law through Moses as they build a tabernacle as God had instructed them to do. So here they are at the base of Mount Sinai. Now what? What do we do with this tabernacle we just built? I mean, we know that the Levites and in particular Aaron and his sons were also, they were to serve as priests. Well, we know that God is holy. We know that we are not, but now what? So what do we do with this tabernacle and these instructions? So this brings us to the book of Leviticus. And as you might be able to figure out just from the title of the book in our English Bibles, the book of Leviticus is pretty much a manual for the Levites. So this is a how-to book for the Levitical priesthood. When I serve as an election official here in the city of Madison, the city clerk always gives me as the chief inspector a huge tote with everything that I'll need to run an election for the entire day. And she thinks of everything. We have a very good city clerk in that regard right now. And in that tote, the clerk always includes not only a binder with the actual statutes on elections from our state law, but the clerk also includes a handbook for election officials in the city of Madison. And between those two notebooks, you can pretty much figure out an answer to almost any question that you may come across as an election official. It is not exciting reading. Uh, I've read through all of that multiple times over the past 30 years or so down in Janesville, also up here in Madison. Uh, but all of that instruction is contained, as I said, in two pretty decent sized binders. But in those two binders, we have what we need. Well, I would suggest that the book of Leviticus is a manual or an inspired guide for the Levites, just as that binder or those binders are for election officials. So the book of Leviticus is that binder. This is how to be a priest. This is what you actually need to know to do your jobs. By the way, some have described the book of Leviticus as the gospel of the Old Testament. And when I started running across those references, I thought, I don't really know about that. But the reasoning for that is Leviticus explains God's path to forgiveness. And so like the gospel that we're familiar with under the new covenant, the message of Leviticus is also you have sinned and this is what you guys need to do about it. 
And I thought that was an interesting observation. I don't usually think of Leviticus as being good news, but I guess in a sense, really, it is. It is God's plan of salvation for his people during that time period. Well, I hope you have a Bible with you because I won't, as I said, I won't be putting every reference on the screen and we'll also be bouncing around a little bit as we move through this book rather quickly. But let's notice the first verse. So hopefully you can find the first verse, Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1. And the book of Levitic, uh, Levitic, Leviticus starts with these words. Then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, and then it goes on from there. Well, if you were with us, and if you remember from last week, we actually ended the book of Exodus with God's presence filling the tabernacle in the form of a cloud. And you may remember that because of that cloud representing God's presence, Moses was unable to enter into the tabernacle. And so I want us to notice here that we have in the opening verse of Leviticus, God calling out to Moses from the tent. So God is on the inside. He is speaking uh, toward the outside of the tent and he is calling out to Moses. And God then continues on from there with some information on various sacrifices, starting right away in verse 2. He just jumps right into it. But a few things we need to note before we get into that. In the Hebrew tradition, books of the Bible were often identified by the first word or the opening line. And this book, therefore, is often identified by the first word in Hebrew, which is, and he called. And he called would be the title of this book. And of course, it was the Lord calling to Moses. And so Moses gets the tabernacle all put together. God's presence fills the tabernacle. And now God calls out to Moses from the tabernacle with some instruction concerning what in the world you guys need to do next. And by the way, the book of Numbers, uh, the next book starts out with these words. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the desert of Sinai on the first day of the second month of the second year after the Israelites came out of Egypt. And so first of all, whatever God had told them to do in Leviticus had apparently worked in that Moses had moved from outside the tent to inside the tent. But secondly, I would also point out we have a time frame. We know that the book of Leviticus, therefore, covers a time period of one month following the completion of the tabernacle. So what we're studying uh, fits in that one month following the completion of this tent. And I know we just read the first verse, but there's also, I think, a value in this case to kind of fast forward to the very last verse in Leviticus. So again, if you have a Bible with you, and again, I hope that you do, I want to encourage you to go all the way to the very end of this book, all the way over to Leviticus chapter 27, verse number 34, where the text says at the very end, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel at Mount Sinai. And so by way of reminder, uh, the people are still at Mount Sinai. This is the book of Leviticus in a nutshell. In terms of a theme or a big idea, I'm thinking we might agree that there is a big emphasis in Leviticus on holiness God is holy, we are not, but this is what we need to do in order to be holy or to be in a right relationship with God. And so in this regard, I think a key passage in Leviticus might be Leviticus 20, verses 7 and 8, where God says, You shall consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. For I am the Lord your God, you shall keep my statutes and practice them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Well, of course, to consecrate is to make something or someone holy, and to be sanctified is to be made holy, and so variations of the word holy are found three times in these two verses, and the word holy is found throughout the book. In terms of a brief summary of what's in the book of Leviticus before we get into it, in chapters 1 through 7, we basically have an outline of the five main types of sacrifices, which is what we plan on looking at tonight. And in the rest of the book, basically outlines God's expectations for the priests, um, laws for what the people need to do in order to stay pure so that they can approach God in worship, as well as kind of a summary of the major feast and the festivals that the, the people are to um, adhere to. So this is Leviticus. Um, and I have kind of some, I guess, good memories associated with the book of Leviticus. That may be kind of weird. I don't know how many other people have kind of good feelings about this book. But when we were first students at Fried Hardeman University, we were taking as many classes as we could. You got a certain number of credits for kind of a flat rate. So we tried to fit in all we could. And once I started uh, dating 
my future wife and kind of we were kind of seeing where things were going. I tried to focus on the New Testament. Well, my future wife kind of focused a little bit more on the old. So we thought, well, why overlap? Let's kind of split up and take some different uh, courses here. And as I prepared for tonight's class, I cracked open that folder on Leviticus and the following chapters and actually ran across her class notes from when she took a class on Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy under um, Everett Hufford in the spring of 1992. And I actually found the syllabus for that class as well as her notes all neatly typed and turned in as, as an assignment. And uh, she did get an A on that assignment, by the way, so very nice right there. And she had some kind of like a brother word processor, and that was kind of a hot commodity on campus back in the early 90s as computers were just barely starting to pop up here and there. So she, she was able to do a lot of typing. Uh, but just a few highlights kind of skimming through her notes uh, summarizing this book. Uh, Brother Hufford said that variations of the word holy were found at least 89 times in the book. So like I said, holiness throughout. And then also in the New Testament, Leviticus is directly quoted at least 40 times. And that's pretty impressive, especially for a book like Leviticus, as short as it is compared to a larger book like Psalms or Isaiah or uh, Jeremiah. So uh, 40 quotes from Leviticus in the New. It's so pretty cool there. And then personally, I remember taking a class on the book of Hebrews under Dr. Dal Flat. And I remember on the very first day we walked into that class, he was known to be a pretty, pretty tough professor, but he explained right away that if you don't understand Leviticus, you will never understand the book of Hebrews. And so my good memory is that we spent the first two weeks of our class on Hebrews by actually studying the book of Leviticus. And I really appreciate that. I didn't appreciate it at the time. I'm thinking, I want to study, I want to study Hebrews, but I think he was very wise to back us up a little bit to really understand what holiness is in the book of Leviticus. So uh, pretty much everything in Leviticus is somewhat of a uh, preview of the sacrifice and the importance of Jesus. But we also have a key reminder in Leviticus that worship is dangerous. And that's something else I want us to keep an eye out for as we go through this book. Worship is dangerous. Worship is serious business. And I don't know if we always understand that. Um, but we have a key reminder in Leviticus that worship is dangerous. Years ago, Annie Dillard wrote a book, uh, Teaching a Stone to Talk. And in that book, this is what she said. It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. For the sleeping God may awake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. What a terrifying reminder. But I just appreciate that comment that she made in that book. Worship is dangerous. And I know sometimes we will talk about what to wear to worship. What do you got to wear to worship? Well, I think as she points out, we should probably be wearing flame-proof safety gear because worship is incredibly serious. And we're going to see this throughout the book of Leviticus. Well, tonight I want us to do kind of a brief overview of the first seven chapters. We will not be reading every verse by any means, not even close to it in the first seven chapters. But in these first seven chapters, we basically have a description of five major sacrifices. And I've arranged our study in chart form. The NIV Study Bible had a very good arrangement here, so a lot of that structure will come from there. They did a very good job of summarizing the first seven chapters. So again, we're not going to read every verse, but we'll hit some of the highlights. And with each one of these, I want us to note the references where the sacrifice is described. And then we'll kind of outline the elements of each sacrifice, what is being sacrificed, and then we'll also summarize the reason for each sacrifice that's made. And as you can hopefully see on your screen at home, we are starting with the burnt offering. So the burnt offering is the very first one up there. Um, for those of you joining us on the phone, or if you're not able to see what's on your screen, the burnt offering is described in all of Leviticus chapter 1. That's verses 1 through 17. It's also briefly mentioned in Leviticus 6, verses 8 through 13, Leviticus 8, 18 through 21, as well as Leviticus 16, 24. And again, the NIV Study Bible had a very good summary of this, so I kind of attribute the guts of this to, to them. I'm thankful for that. Um, because the sacrifices kind of tend to run together sometimes. You start, you're reading, you're like, what, what in the world? Which one is this? I don't know. Sometimes you have to come back. So the chart is helpful. 
But notice the Lord starts right in with a description of the burnt offering in Leviticus chapter 1. And I'll read this first one just kind of to give us a sense of what's going on here. This will give us a taste for the rest. So this is Leviticus 1 verses 2 through 9. God says this, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When any man of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd or the flock. If his offering is a bird offering from the herd, he shall offer it, a male without defect. He shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. He shall slay the young bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall offer up the blood and sprinkle the blood around on the altar uh, that is at the doorway of the tent of meeting. He shall then skin the burnt offering and cut it into its pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, the head and the suet, over the wood which is on the fire that is on the altar. Its entrails, however, and its legs he shall wash with water, and the priest shall offer up in smoke all of it on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. So I want us to notice that a burnt offering was to be male. It was also to be physically perfect, that is, without any physical defect. And so if I've got 20 bulls out in the field, I can't say, well, I've got to sacrifice one of these to the Lord. And I see that this one over here has got a broken leg, so I might as well offer that one. Uh, that doesn't work with God. God wants the very best. And so uh, this offering has to be male, and it's got to be physically perfect. So those are the first couple principles that we have here, and those principles will hold true throughout. Well, the second big idea I want us to notice is how up close and personal this is. Did you notice that? In verse 4, whoever is bringing the sacrifice is to start by laying his hand on the head of the animal before he kills it. So let's notice, this isn't something the priests are going to do. This is something that you're going to have to do. If you've sinned, you need to offer this thing. If you're offering this as an act of devotion to the Lord, you've got to put your head on, or your hand on the head of the animal before killing it. And so this can't be outsourced. I, I can't drop off a bull and just drive away and leave it there for the priest to deal with. I cannot um, subcontract that to the priest. I've got to do this. So I've got to go in. I've actually got to do this myself. And the reason is by laying my hand on the animal, this animal is making atonement for me in my sins. Someone once described atonement to me by suggesting that it's the idea of being at one with God. If you think of the word, at one meant, or atonement, being at one with God. This is what atonement means. And so when the worshiper puts his hand on the animal, the animal, in a sense, was taking on the guilt or the punishment for that person's sins. There is a, a transmittal of sins, we might say, at this moment. So this is personal. Something that I have done is causing this animal to take my place before the Lord. And this is symbolized by the worshiper placing his hand on the animal. And remember the very first sacrifice that was ever made in world history. Remember Adam and Eve's sin. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. That wasn't doing it. And remember God got them animal skins for coverings. You can't get an animal skin without killing the animal. So my understanding is that was kind of the concept of sacrifice. It goes all the way back there to the very beginning. It was personal. I did this terrible thing, and an animal has to shed its blood because of me. So this is not distant. This, is, this animal is dying in my place, in a sense. Not only that, but let's also notice the worshiper also has to be the one to kill the animal by slitting its throat. And I wonder how many of us have ever killed an animal by slitting its throat. Several have probably killed an animal with a bullet or with an arrow or maybe with a trap of some kind. But I want us to note that this is up close and personal, isn't it? In my mind, this is pretty messy also, isn't it? In my mind, it would probably be hard to leave the tabernacle after this without some evidence, without being covered in blood, without having blood on my sandals and on my robe and so on. Blood would have a tendency to squirt or splatter. 
as this animal struggles and dies. This is hands-on. I, I personally am causing this thing to happen. The priests are not doing this. I'm doing this as the worshiper. Well, at this point, the priests then step in and they take some of that blood, they sprinkle it around the altar, and then they skin the animal, they cut it up into various chunks, they arrange those chunks on the altar to be burned, and, and the rest of this chapter describes a similar process for sheep or goats or various birds. And I think the, the thought there is not everybody can afford a bull, and so God makes provisions for that. God accepts what we have, but it has to be the best. The reference over in chapter 6, by the way, addresses how to deal with the ashes. So the priests were to change their clothes and take the ashes outside the camp. We burn wood at our house. We heat with wood. So we're dealing with ashes all the time. Every few days, you know, we have to empty the wood stove, put it in a bucket, take that out, spread it on the garden or whatever. So from a practical point of view, as the priestly handbook here, God's like, this is what you have to do with the ashes. And I think that reference over in chapter 6 may also emphasize the fact that the fire in the altar is to burn continually. So this is to be going 24-7. Can't let this thing go out. And some have compared that to keeping the baptistry ready at all times. And I appreciate that. Uh, sometimes we'll go to a place to worship and, you know, you ask about the baptistry. Well, I don't know. We haven't really looked at it for a while or it's dirty or... You know, you need to have the baptistry available. And so it's kind of the, the similar thing. The fire has to be ready at all times. If somebody wants to sacrifice, they can do it. And the reference over in chapter 8 is of Moses actually making this sacrifice for the first time. The reference in chapter 16 says that the priest is to bathe himself before participating in this uh, sacrifice. So those are kind of the, the references. And uh, the elements here are depending upon the person's income, most likely. And uh, since there's no particular reason given for this, the uh, burnt offering seems to be an offering that people might make just because. So this is their way of voluntarily expressing their devotion to God. It wasn't tied to a particular day. Um, if I need atonement, if I've done something, this is, this is my way of approaching God on his terms. Well, the next one up here is the grain offering. And the grain offering is found in all of chapter 2, as well as in Leviticus 6, 14 through 23. Um, if you have your Bibles, let's just take a quick look at the very first part of this. Leviticus 2, in Leviticus 2, 1 through 3, God says... Now, when anyone presents a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, and shall take from it his handful of fine flour and of its oil with all of its frankincense. And the priest shall offer it up in smoke as its memorial portion on the altar, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord." The remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy of the offerings to the Lord by fire. So this is an offering primarily of flour. Today, if God wanted us to make a sacrifice of flour, how would we go about getting that flour? Well, in my case, if God said, I want you to offer a couple cups of flour, um, I would walk out my front door. I'd walk a little bit less than a mile up and over the hill by our house on the southwest side of Madison to go to Aldi. And I would walk in, I'd purchase a five pound bag of flour, and it would not be a huge financial sacrifice. In fact, I probably, I might not even look at the price on it, because I know this is the only flour Aldi has, <laughs> so there are really no, no other options. I would get the flour that we always get, maybe not even paying attention to the price, because it's really not too much. And, uh, and then I would, so I would just walk down there and get it, and bring it home, and offer it. However, 3,400 years ago in the wilderness of Sinai, how might you go about getting flour? Uh, that's a different story, isn't it? So at this point, they're about a year out of Egypt. They don't have crops yet. They're basically nomads. And so to get flour, they'd have to trade with others, either from the area, or maybe those who were traveling through the area. Uh, later, once they get to the promised land, they could plant crops, but it would take a while. They'd have to then harvest and process that wheat and grind it. And, and I'm just saying it would be a huge deal to make an offering of flour to the Lord. And that's something we may not appreciate unless we think through it. Uh, in that passage we just read, we find that they are to pour some oil on it, along with frankincense. And the priests are to divide it, offering up part of it as a sacrifice on the altar. They are to burn it with fire. But what about the rest of it? As I understand this, God explains that the priests are then allowed to keep this for themselves. And so this was one of God's ways of providing for the priests. They could then take this flower home. 
uh, either to feed their families or perhaps they could trade it for something else that they might need. Uh, continuing on in this chapter, we find the grain offering might be prepared in an oven. It may be prepared on a griddle or in a pan with a lid. Those are just kind of interesting details. God is saying, you know, you can prepare it this way, this way, or this way. So they had several ways of preparing this sacrifice as an offering to the Lord. And once again, they share this with the priest. Um, I also want us to skip down to Leviticus 2, verses 11, 12, and 13. If you have a Bible, Leviticus 2, 11 through 13, God says that no grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall not offer up in smoke any leaven or any honey as an offering by fire to the Lord. As an offering of first fruits, you shall bring them to the Lord, but they shall not ascend for a soothing aroma on the altar. Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Well, two things here. First of all, no leaven, and that includes honey. Um, so why is that significant in the New Covenant? Of course, we know from the New Testament, leaven is sometimes used to represent sin. And it's also tied to the Lord's Supper, where we use unleavened bread to remember the body of Jesus and how he suffered for us on the cross. That, of course, goes back to the Passover. But the second thing to notice here, not only can they not use leaven, but notice they are not to forget the salt. <laughs> and uh, salt is pretty important, isn't it? Uh, about a week ago, I made uh, biscuits at our house, buttermilk biscuits from scratch. And for the first time in my life, I forgot to add the salt. It was right between the two sets of ingredients in that recipe, and I just overlooked it. Not good. Not good at all. Um, I had to eat a lot of bacon with those biscuits to make up for the lack of salt, but it still wasn't the same. And so God says, no leaven. And then secondly, whatever you do, do not forget the salt. And the salt also has a new covenant connection, doesn't it? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus compares our influence to salt. We are the salt of the world. And something else I didn't point out earlier, the grain was also to be mixed with frankincense. And why is frankincense familiar to us as Christians? That's one of the gifts the wise men brought to Jesus. And so we've got another New Testament connection here. We're just seeing little bits and pieces. Um, I was going to skip the last few verses until I realized that we're about to have the first of, I think, only about two references to grits in the Bible. I have a complicated relationship with grits. With uh, both of my parents having grown up in Tennessee, I understand that uh, grits are the food of my people. <laughs> However, I am also not a fan of eating wet sand. Um, but with the family connection, I usually kind of force myself to eat grits at some point during every trip to Tennessee. And I've, I've asked advice from my southern friends and family, how do I do this? How do I get this done? And some have suggested butter, copious amounts of butter. I kind of like that idea. I'm a big fan of butter. Uh, others have suggested sugar or brown sugar. Others have suggested copious amounts of cheese. Shredded cheddar is not too bad on there. I hate to ruin cheddar by adding it to grits. Uh, some have suggested using bacon as a fork to eat your grits. I had a friend in West Tennessee who said, try that. Um, I've tried shrimp and grits, many other combinations, but I'm still kind of searching for a way to eat grits that isn't terrible. If you have ideas, let me know. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that we do have a reference to grits at the end of Leviticus chapter 2. Grits may be offered to the Lord as part of this grain offering. And again, we don't have any special occasion here, but uh, this is another one of those just because offerings, an offering expressing a devotion to the Lord. In chapter 3, we get into the gruesome details uh, of what is known as a peace offering or a fellowship offering in some translations. And the word is a word we would recognize as tracing back to the Hebrew word shalom. The idea of peace or wholeness, the restoring of relationships, and since there's no special occasion specified here either, uh, some of the commentaries are suggesting that this offering is intended to celebrate fellowship with God, which in turn uh, encourages us to be at peace or in fellowship with one another. And based on the variety of foods, animals, as well as grain together, as and with how this sacrifice is to be eaten by both the priest and the worshiper, the, kind of the theory is that pretty much this is a uh, fellowship dinner type situation here. And again, we won't get into all the details we've done already, as we've done already with the first part or with the others. Uh, I want to point out, though, that in the instructions for this offering over in Leviticus 7, God is very clear that the offering is to be eaten right away 
with uh, leftovers allowed only on the second day, but on the third day, all leftovers are to be burned. Interesting. Personally, I'm kind of liking that rule. I eat leftovers. Some things are actually better on the second day than they are when they're fresh. But from a food safety perspective, leftovers get really iffy after a few days. Uh, some of you know years ago I made the mistake of reading my wife's food safety handbook when she was getting Serve Safe certified for her work with the school district. And I was shocked at all of the ways that food can kill you. Uh, rice, for example, is one of the absolute worst in terms of bacteria. Rice is the perfect host, the perfect breeding ground for bacteria. It needs to be thrown away after 24 hours. Um, other foods pretty much have to go after day four. That's kind of today with our modern refrigeration, perfect temperature and all that. Four is really stretching it, but nothing after four. But in the wilderness, God is very clear on this. No leftovers after uh, day number two. Day number three, it's got to go. Burn it in the fire. Everything has to be eaten by day number two at the latest. And I appreciate that. He's trying to keep his people alive through the wilderness. You don't want some disease uh, spreading through two to three million people in the middle of nowhere. Also in Leviticus 7, we find that there may be different reasons that cause someone to make this offering. And the offering itself is slightly different depending on the circumstances. It may be offered out of thankfulness. It may be offered as the result of making a vow. It may just be a completely free will offering just because I want to offer something to God. But whatever you do, don't eat any leftovers after day number two. I think that's kind of the big deal from here that's different from the others. Uh, so we now come to the sin offering in Leviticus 4, 1 down through chapter 5, verse 13. It's also referred to in Leviticus 6, 24 through 30, as well as in Leviticus 8, 14 through 17, and in Leviticus 16, 3 through 22. And again, we won't read all this since we don't need to be offering these when we sin today, but I do want to note a few details. And we'll start with the first few verses of Leviticus 4. Leviticus 4, 1, 2, and 3. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, if a person sins unintentionally in any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done and commits any of them, if the anointed priest sins so as to bring guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord a bull without defect as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. And then it continues on from there. But what I want us to emphasize here is that this is somebody who sins unintentionally. And as we'll find out later, this is kind of the, the kind of sin where there's no real uh, restitution involved. That'll be for the last category up here. So I kind of think of what our kids did when they were little. If they did something and we had to confront them on it, their instinctual reply was always, it was an accident. Have you ever heard that from your kids? You know, why did you, it was an accident. Like, I didn't mean to, it just kind of happened. You know, well, everything of course is not an accident. <laughs> But we also have to realize that there are a whole lot of sins that we commit even today where we never really set out to commit a sin. Uh, sometimes we sin in ignorance. Maybe I do something that I really didn't know was actually a sin. And so somebody has to point that out to me and then I understand it. Then I have to ask for forgiveness and move on from there. Uh, sometimes we sin through carelessness. Maybe we knew it was a sin, but we didn't really think through something as we should have done. We weren't thinking properly. And sometimes we sin due to human weakness. So I don't intend to sin, but due to the fact that I am a human being, I fell. I stumbled. I fall. I, it just happened. I slipped and I fell, so to speak. So in those cases, what we did was still sin, though. If we've transgressed God's law, we did wrong. It separates us from God, and we do need to do something about it, even though we never intended or set out to sin in the first place. So here God gives the plan. And the sacrifices are different depending on either a person's role in the community or that person's ability to pay. In the first example, we're dealing with an anointed priest who sins. In other words, that guy probably should have known better. And so he needs to bring a bull. And then we've got the instructions for sacrificing that bull. Well, the second scenario is when the entire nation sins. And I think we need to realize it is possible for an entire nation to sin. You know, sometimes we act as a group, don't we? And I know we're talking about God's people uh, back then, Israel. You know, their government and their religion were one and the same. But I would suggest even today as a nation, we may do some things as a society that all of us, not 100%, but our society seems to approve of. Uh, we may 
come together as a nation to elect an evil man. Uh, we may approve as a nation, collectively speaking, we may approve of something that God does not approve of, and so on. And there are many times when I think as a nation we have missed the mark. We've, we've tripped, we've stumbled, we've fallen, and so on. Well, back then also, there were times when the entire nation would turn toward the worship of idols. Not 100% of the people, but when you looked at Israel, you would look at them and say, wow, those people worship idols. You know, they have stumbled and fallen as a nation. And uh, there are times when the entire nation would fail to have faith in God. Uh, you remember when everybody listened to the Ten Spies instead of listening to Joshua and Caleb? You know, there's an example of a majority of the people following this evil, spineless, faithless report and being influenced by that and getting sucked in that direction. So those are a few examples, and in cases like that, maybe the nation is to come together and sacrifice a bull. So all of us together, we're having this national assembly. We're going to make this sacrifice. We are asking for God's forgiveness. And God gives the instructions concerning how to do this in the priestly handbook here in Leviticus 4, 13 through 22. Starting in verse 23, we have the third scenario when we have a leader who sins. Not to find who that is, but a leader, somebody influential in the community. And when that sin is brought to his attention, the leader is to sacrifice a male goat. And then we have the instructions on how to do that. Then starting in verse 27, we have instructions for what to do when a member of the community sins. So a regular everyday citizen. This guy does something. This guy has to bring a female goat, apparently worth somewhat less than a male goat. Or he may also bring a lamb. And the instructions for these various scenarios here are covered down through chapter 5, verse 6. And the plan in all of these cases is for whoever sins to confess that sin and then bring his offering to the Lord. And the priest will make atonement on his behalf. And then starting in Leviticus 5, verse 7, we actually have provision for those who cannot even afford a lamb. And I love that God allows the poor to substitute two doves or two pigeons. And if the person can't even afford pigeons, down in verse 11, uh, that person can actually bring an offering of flour. So the poor are not left out. So what impresses me here is that God is mindful of the poor. If someone sinned and owed God a bowl, some people just couldn't afford that. And it'd be over. What would you do? Yeah, You can't afford it. You can't do what God is asking. But God understands that. And God has a plan for dealing with that scenario. It's not about the bull or the goat or the lamb, but it's about a person's relationship with God. And certainly God does not discriminate against the poor. So this is the sin offering. Well, finally this evening, we get to the guilt offering. And as I understand it, this is an offering for sin where restitution is required. You know, there are times when we may sin when we need to pay something back. So, for example, if I were to steal your car under the old law, I couldn't just whack a pigeon and keep your car, could I? That doesn't make it okay. I would need to sacrifice to God whatever was owed to get me and God back on the same page, okay with each other. But in order to do that, I would also need to pay you back. I'd have to give your car back. I can't keep the thing I stole from you and be okay with God. So we've got to settle it with others, and we've got to also settle it with God. So... Uh, the guilt offering here involves restitution. Let's notice what God says in Leviticus uh, 7. Let's look at verses 1 through 7 actually here. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, When a person sins and acts unfaithfully against the Lord and deceives his companion in regard to a deposit or a security entrusted to him or through robbery, or if he has extorted from his companion, or has found what was lost and lied about it and sworn falsely, so that he sins in regard to any one of the things a man may do, then it shall be when he sins and becomes guilty that he shall restore what he took by robbery, or what he got by extortion, or the deposit which was entrusted to him, or the lost thing which he found, or anything about which he swore falsely. He shall make restitution for it in full, and add to it one-fifth more. He shall give it to the one whom it belongs on the day he presents his guilt offering. Then he shall bring to the priest his guilt offering to the Lord, a ram without defect from the flock, according to your valuation for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he will be forgiven for any one of the things which he may have done to incur guilt." So we notice this isn't sinning unintentionally. This isn't, oops, accidentally I did this. 
This is acting unfaithfully against the Lord. This is more serious. And in these cases, cases of robbery or extortion or lying under oath that affects somebody financially, the person must make the offering, but the person must also make restitution, repayment of the amount plus one-fifth or plus 20%. By the way, can you think of somebody in one of the gospel accounts who was confronted and ended up promising to make restitution? I'm thinking of Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the wee little man? Over in Luke 19, Jesus invites himself into Zacchaeus' home for a meal, and I really admire Jesus for doing that. I find it so hard to invite myself over into other people's homes for a meal. So if you want to invite me over, that makes it a lot easier. That's kind of cool. But, you know, Jesus had a way of, hey, I need to come to your house today. And people would just say, okay, they would just, he would just come in. Um, so Jesus invites himself into Zacchaeus' home for a meal. We don't know what was said during that meal. But when it was over, Zacchaeus says in Luke 19, verse 8, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. So notice Zacchaeus then understood the concept of restitution. And I think he was obviously going above and beyond there. Now, as we think back over these five main categories of sacrifices, let's understand that over time, the people got this all out of whack, and they abused even this, this graceful offer of being made at one or having atonement made with God, and they, they messed it up, and they abused it. In fact, in the time of Jeremiah, in those days leading up to the fall of Jerusalem under the Babylonians, the people were apparently trying to prevent the coming destruction by multiplying sacrifices. You know, the, the Babylonians, they're getting closer. Kill another bull. Kill another one. However, God sends a message through Jeremiah. This is what he says in Jeremiah 7, 21 through 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them saying, obey my voice and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will walk in all the way which I command you, that it may be well with you. In other words, even after everything the Lord has said here, it is really not about the sacrifices. But instead, God would much rather have the people simply obey his voice. That's what God wants. He wants our heartfelt obedience. And we've got a similar statement in Amos 5, 21 through 27. And God once again refers to these sacrifices. This time he speaks through the prophet Amos. And this is what he says. I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for forty years, O house of Israel? You also carried along Sikath, your king, and Kayun, your images, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will make you go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. So again, by way of review, it's not really about the sacrifices. Without heartfelt obedience, the sacrifices themselves were actually offensive to God. Under the new covenant, Jesus thankfully is our sacrifice. And in response, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, don't we? According to Paul in Romans 12. And then we offer up the fruit of our lips as a sacrifice of praise to God, according to uh, those two verses there in Hebrews chapter 13. Well, this brings us to the end of our first lesson from the book of Leviticus. And we studied the first seven chapters, kind of an overview of the five main sacrifices under the law of Moses. Before we close, I want to point out something else I read in one of the commentaries a few days ago. And there are, there are more words directly from God in the book of Leviticus than in any other book of the Bible. I didn't realize that, did you? It's not the longest book in the Bible, 
but there are more words directly from God in this book than in any other. Now, I didn't verify that. I read that. If anybody wants to verify that and read through the book and every book of the Bible and keep a tally, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Um, but I'm just saying there's a, there's a lot from God in this book, and I'm so glad that we get to look at it. Uh, next week, let's look at the ordination of the priest, and let's take a look at a disaster that happens almost immediately. This will be in Leviticus chapters 8, 9, and 10. So seven chapters tonight. We'll look at three chapters next week, if the Lord wills. As always, thank you so much for joining us tonight. If there's anything that we need to be praying about, if there's some way that we can help or encourage you as a congregation, we, we hope you'll reach out. You can send an email to me, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text, 608-224-0274. As we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a holy and all-powerful God. We know that you hate sin, but we're thankful tonight that you've made a way for us to come back, and you've made a way to restore the relationship when we step away from it, even when we rebel against you. Thank you, Father, for sending your only Son into this world as a sacrifice, for taking our place on the cross, and taking the place of those hundreds upon thousands of lambs, and the goats, and the birds, and the bulls, all of those things that were offered continually in ancient times. We now know today, Father, that Jesus is far better. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you, Father, for being merciful toward us. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. And we come to you tonight in his name. Amen.